that's the great thing about film, David. <laughs> well, it feels if, like if you, you mess it up, you can take, do another take. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Just like interviews. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> This is David Stark from Watcher Pass, and today I'm joined by Doug McCorkle, the star of I'm an Electric Lampshade, which is running the festival circuit right now. We're going to talk to him in just a second, but first, let's check out the trailer. And while you're watching, if you can like and subscribe to this channel, that would be fantastic. It helps me out a lot. Thank you. Doug was your typical accountant that you would expect to see when you walk into a company for the first time. Oh, I've been in this office for 18 years, but it's not what I want to do for the rest of my life. I would think over the course of maybe 15 years, it took us to really get Doug to let his hair down. And when he did, it was really letting his hair down. He doesn't look much like a corporate accountant anymore. I'm an electric lampshade. So today I'm joined by Doug McCorkle, the star of I'm an Electric Lampshade, which is a uh, it's a fascinating, I guess, coming of age documentary about a, uh, a man who decides to pursue his dreams at the age of 60, which I actually I love because, you know, as an older person who is starting to lose my hair and trying to kind of come out, of, come up with ways to get out of my shell like this. This was really just an interesting, interesting, fascinating story. So, I mean, I guess we should probably start with your your catchphrase from the from the movie. It's only 50 50. <laughs> it's only 50 50. <laughs> so, if, if I Google that, is that, are you going to come up with it? Like, it, like, it seems like that was a pretty big commercial. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, it was completely <laughs> fictitious. Uh, that honey lasan yogurt was um, an interesting uh, concept that John Clayton Doyle, the writer and director of the film, uh, came up with and uh, and uh, wrote the lyrics to, and then we had two great Filipino actors who um, converted some of the English to Tagalog, and um, there we are, honey loss on yogurt. And and so you were you were singing. I, I, it sounded, it, was it Tagalog? It sounded like maybe there was some Spanish in there. I couldn't really tell what the language yeah, was. Yeah, it's, you were it's either that. it's either English or um, Tagalog. Okay, um, the entire song is one of the two because they speak both in the philippines so and and you uh, did you pick this up while you were there did you just did you memorize it for the song i mean it was it was pretty seamless like i mean maybe that's just you as a performer but it seemed like you know it didn't seem like you were stumbling over any of the any of the lyrics even though it was in another language yeah it, well it it took some practice and i had to get coached on how to speak tagalog because of course i don't speak it normally but um yeah uh you know uh just Lots of rehearsal and memorization, and there we go. That's the great thing about film, David. <laughs> well, it feels if, like if you... you mess it up, you can do another take. <laughs> That's true, <laughs> just like interviews. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but I mean, it seems like you, you must have been used to coaching at this point because you it seems like this, this whole documentary is you kind of being coached. I guess let's go to the uh to the start because um, this was just such a fascinating story, and you know. I love the idea of you having this dream and then going for it. And I imagine there, you know, it seemed like everyone was supportive around you, but I imagine there were a lot of people going like, why, like, why would you do this? So where, you know, where did the impetus for this crazy journey come from? Um, well, the, the whole, I had never really thought seriously about being a performer, certainly not being an actor. And um, the whole idea came from, um, starting out with a music video that I made um, actually for my supervisor's retirement. Um, and I had never sung before, I had never danced before, but I had a great time doing it. I had four colleagues that I worked with who um, really enjoyed it too and encouraged me. And, um, and the music video was a huge success and I got the bug, um, I admit it. And um, I mean, clearly, because we saw your journey after. <laughs> yeah. And and so um, uh, I was working with John Clayton Doyle, uh, who was the choreographer for the original music video. We continued to work together and we came up with the idea to just make a short film, uh, something that would incorporate a music video and also, um, you know, have a storyline to it. But then we started filming 
And the film just grew organically until it became the feature length film that it is today. And, and uh, we did all that filming over the course of a little over four years. And then it took us about a, um, a little over a year to do the post-production on it. But um, it just was an amazing adventure and uh, one that, that um, well, I would recommend it to anybody, but I know that's not <laughs> realistic, but uh, it was, it completely took me out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was just, that, that was a life-changing experience for me. It was great. Yeah, I'm amazed. Like that music video for your retirement was was awesome. But also, like my first thought was, this is like, it's not like risque, but it is a little bit more out there than I think uh, a lot of people would would do for their retirements, especially kind of your your last impression. But uh, you know, it was also a, you know an amazing moment, and also must have been very memorable. I bet people still talk about that uh, in the office and and when you see them. So that was a. Uh, yeah brave stupid maybe somewhere in between I'm yeah sure. probably uh definitely a bit of both yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i was having fun um i mean that 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 part of the documentary is absolutely true that was my real retirement party and um yes i dressed in that uh ridiculous costume and um played that music video but hey you only live once you might as well enjoy it and you're only going to retire once like that so hey go out with a bang Exactly. And it's really like the, you know, that, that, that kind of cliched statement, you're only as old as you feel like you definitely looked like and felt like you were much younger than someone who was retiring, <laughs> like yeah, you were performing for, sure. for someone who was retiring. Yeah, well, it, you know, I think uh, collaborating with people who are young and energetic and creative um, just just brings out the youth in you. And um, it certainly did for me. And um uh, you know, I really couldn't be happier about it because, you know, I, I talked to other people who are my age who are um, either considering retiring or have retired. And I hear, a, I hear a lot of people say, well, I don't know what I'm going to do for the people who haven't retired. They say, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I haven't retired yet because I'm just worried about what, I'm, what am I going to do when I retire? And for people who have retired, they're in some cases bored. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was determined not to go that route and I definitely didn't. <laughs> yeah. And you always, like, you always hear the thing that I've always worried about and you always hear about is people who say like, okay, I'm going to do stuff when I retire and then they retire. And, you know, at that point you might be too old or you lost some motivation. Or you've lost some of that like love of like travel. Everyone always says I'm going to travel when I'm older, but then, you know, you never know if you're going to be able to, whereas you are putting yourself out there and you are definitely staying active when you're retired. And I think that is amazing. Like you retired, early enough that you could do this and also kind of had the motivation to reshape your body and persona for this, this role, which was, uh, it was fascinating to watch. Well, I, I have, uh, there's a colleague who I, um, used to work with at the company. Um, and he was on the, he was on the board of directors and he was retired and he turned to me when I was retiring and said, stay active, Doug, um, keep doing things. He said, you, you, um, you uh, last in age when you're an active person. So mm -hmm. I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. So I followed his advice. Definitely. <laughs> you can definitely say that. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, I probably took it a step further. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, this whole movie is about extremes. So that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, so the, the film is, it's, it's billed as a documentary narrative. So I'm, I'm kind of curious what that means. Because, I mean, you definitely did the work. You put yourself out there you kind of i don't know acting skills because you kind of you had to learn how to act you had to learn how to perform you had singing lessons uh but i guess where is the narrative part it sounds like maybe some of these were filmed for the movie but then again when you're doing that you are preparing yourself for this show so i guess how much of it was kind of i don't know organic how much of it was filmed was it just always kind of a, a gray line in this in this uh movie well, that, that's it. the interesting part of the film is that a lot of people who watch it say, I'm not sure what was real and what was fictional. So, uh, which is, which is, which was the, um, which was the goal of it, one of the goals mm -hmm. of the film. Um, but uh, yes, there are parts of the film that are fictional narratives. Um, for example, uh, the Sinandres finishing school in the Philippines. 
is not a real school. Oh, um, yeah, I know. Uh, awesome. I know. I'm sure that's disappointing, but <laughs> hey, you know what? The, I, I need um, to put myself but, out there too. <laughs> but Sin Andre, um, who was played by um, Cesar Valentino, was one of my dance co coaches. He's an amazing Vogue performer. Um, and uh, the drag queens who participated um, as the students in Sin Andre's are actually drag performers in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. um, so there are parts of it that are that are real, and there are parts of it that are that are kind of fictional narrative, and um, and it kind of weaves in and out. Um, the training montage that's in there that's real. That was me training with dancers. Um, uh, uh, the singing lessons, obviously behind the scenes, were real. Uh, all the preparation I did to be the performer in the live concert at the end. All that prep was real. Um, my my wife suffering from mental illness, which is discussed in the film, that's real. She does. Um, so it it kind of weaves in and out, David. Just like a music video, kind of blurs a line between reality and, and performance. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's why, like one big, long music video. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and, and there are parts that do feel like one big, long music video, which is why I think where some of this confusion can come from. Uh, I, 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 will, I will admit, I'm a little sad that the, the, the school doesn't exist because I thought that was a really interesting way to kind of and I assume, I assume this, you know, you did this as well. It's kind of an interesting way to put yourself out there, right? You're trying to become this rock persona. So what better way than to, uh, you know, train with people that are just trying to completely change who they are. And I thought that that was a very, you know, abrupt and drastic way to kind of force yourself out of your shell. Yeah. Um, John and I both had the goal of, of um, including a lot of diversity in the, in um, the, in the entire film, mm -hmm. which was one of the reasons that we went to the Philippines. It was one of the reasons that we went to Mexico City. It, um, we, we just wanted it to include all cultures, various cultures, um, you know, just be all inclusive. So, uh, I mean, the drag idea was my idea originally. Um, and uh, the fear was the song that we ended up landing on to perform in drag. And um, so going to San Andres school that included drag performers just was a perfect segue into that whole um, music video that we ended up doing in the middle of the film. Yeah, that um, makes that makes. Yeah, sense. but it was it, but it was uh, it was a great experience. I mean, the uh, the other beautiful thing about this for me personally was um, I got to meet people, David, that I never would have met if I had you know retired and done the normal thing. Um, these people were just completely amazing um, and and uh, creative and um, you know vivacious in their own right. So um, you know that that in itself was just an amazing experience. Well, I think it's also really interesting, that, you know, the international aspect because that also kind of helped me when I was watching it because I. I'm not keyed into any of these worlds. I'm not keyed into the EDM world, I'm not keyed into like music. So I was like, well, maybe he is a big star in like the Philippines and in Mexico because mm -hmm. you have these international aspects. I was like, oh, maybe this is how like a modern person gets prominence. You kind of go where wherever the, the the fan base comes. So I thought that that was a that was a fun part of the documentary. Yeah, as well. absolutely. And and that you're at, you hit it right on the head. That's what we were trying to do. We were trying to say, you know what? Does it really make sense that Doug is a popular performer in the U.S.? Maybe not so much, but the Philippines, maybe Mexico City. Hey, you know that's that's always a possibility. Put him someplace that he's completely out of his comfort zone. Um, both in real life and, you know, uh, in performance life. And let's see how he does. Um, and so, you know, the one thing I want to ask is the, the commercial, the honey commercial, uh, did you get to keep that outfit? Because that outfit was amazing. And now that I know that it was filmed, maybe you did. Maybe you got to keep that sweet, like, bee hammer pants outfit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah like, well, they offered it to me, and um, I actually uh, gave it to... Uh, John Clayton Doyle, the director. So he, uh, so I, I'm sure he has it in his closet somewhere. He'll pull it out for a special occasion. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> the, uh, the the premiere, the actual the theatrical premiere, would be a perfect place for that. That absolutely. Although this feels like maybe the premiere should be a concert. Like maybe you have a concert where you screen the movie in a concert hall and then you perform during it. I don't know, like some sort of music and movie merge. 
Yeah, you never know. I mean, we'll, we haven't uh, gotten to that point yet, but um, there's always a possibility. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, so it's currently running the festival circuit, and, I, and I, it seems yes. to be getting buzz. Like, it seems like there are enough little laurels on the uh, on the poster that it seems like it is getting plenty of buzz. So I imagine the theatrical premiere is just, you know, it, it's, it, it's a given, essentially. Yeah, we, we really hope so. I mean, um, obviously, we have a sales agent for the film, and, and uh, so... Um, we will be pursuing distribution opportunities in the near future, which is very exciting. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Uh, and so I just want to kind of follow your journey. So, you, you know, in, in the film, and also it seems like you as well, you went to the Philippines, did some training there, and then mm -hmm. you were in New York uh, learning dancing. Did that happen? I mean, did that happen sequentially? Were, that, were those kind of happening together? And, and what was it like in New York when you are, you're training with, dancers and you know the, the the theoretical new york starving artist and you are definitely not a starving artist at this point you're you know definitely just someone who's trying to kind of break out of his mold so what was that like you know being accepted by that crew did, it, did they just care you know that you wanted to dance that you were serious or, or was there some sort of was it was that also kind of a difficult transition um that was that was a very challenging time because um i was really getting a crash course in singing Mm -hmm. learning to perform and also dancing all at once so um, my performance coach said basically Doug we're trying to get you ready in about a year's time for something that would take most performers you know a, a lifetime mm -hmm. so um uh yeah so it completely took me out of my comfort zone it was a lot of hard work um I worked with very um optimistic um colleagues, uh, coaches who just, you know, kept, kept encouraging me and said, keep going, keep going. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. Just keep going. We'll get you there. Mm -hmm. And um, they did. I mean, they just did an amazing job. So, um, but to answer your earlier question about the sequence of events, yes, we did uh, do all the filming in the Philippines first. And then I came back and, and really started um, preparing um, very hard for the, um, for the Mexico Live concert. Mm -hmm. And that preparation took uh, um, the better part of a year. And um, then we finally filmed. That was the last big piece of filming that we did for the movie. So a lot of what you see in this film, how it's filmed and how it plays out is um, pretty close to sequentially how it was filmed. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that, and that 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 makes sense. And and you know, that's I can't believe that you prepared for a year for that concert, and you were able to like, make that much progress in a year. Like I'm trying to think, like what I've done in this last year, and it has not been that. <laughs> well, when you're real, when you really, I mean, I was down in the city. I because I live I live um, a little outside of the city, and and so um, I was down in the city, you know, for weeks um, uh, every week. Uh, don't, going to dance classes, getting private coaching, taking singing lessons, uh, going to performance uh, coaching um, twice a week. And then I had to come home and practice on my own. So um, yeah, it was a lot of time. My wife, Gina, God bless her. She was supportive, but there were times that she was like, when is this going to be over? Seriously. Yeah, I can, I can and, and, uh, but, but she stuck with it. I'm a very, very, very appreciative for that. Yeah, that's, uh, it seems like, and, and the film actually touches on this, which I thought was a, you know, I don't know if Noble's right, or at least accurate. And also, yeah, I think it probably was a little Noble because it did show, you know, you going on these, these adventures, kind of putting yourself out there. And then Gina at home kind of happy for you, but you could also detect that you, I don't know if, if she was just sad that you weren't there or maybe, I don't know what the emotion was, but there was definitely some emotion that was displayed while she was kind of watching you on your adventure. And I thought that that was, a, that was interesting. I, I think, you know, maybe some documentaries might not have put that in, but I thought it was very important that it showed, you know, like there, there is a cost to this dream and that, that, that she is helping to kind of bear that cost. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that was one of the very, shall we say, real parts of the film, because in, in working on this for, for almost five full years, um, uh, there, there definitely was a cost to, to um, Gina. It put strains on our relationship at times. Um, and, you know, because she suffers from men mental illness, um, she has good times and she has difficult times. 
And in some ways, um, what was portrayed in the film with her sadness and some of what was going on for her is a real portrayal because she did she did have very difficult periods while we were doing the filming, while I was preparing to do the live concert. Um, we had some real tough times, but she is she is a trooper and she soldiered through it. And um, and I just give her an amazing amount of credit for doing that. So we tried to portray that a bit, David, in the film. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad that you did because it is it is, it is an important thing as well. Um, so the, the the Mexico live performance was it was so out there. Um, so I guess you know, the, the 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 blunt question is: Was that filmed was it uh, a concert was it maybe somewhere in between like you had you know some set pieces but i mean you, you were clearly performing so it was a definitely a concert i guess what how how much of that was organic versus how much of that was filmed um and I, and I, whatever the answer is it came together amazingly i, I really love that scene so yeah the, the concert concert was a highlight for me because um uh uh the costumes the mm -hmm. setup the venue i mean it was just and and the crowd was uh, just great. Um, it was filmed, um, obviously. I mean, we we um, we used a lot of cameras, and we had a lot of people there, and and uh, that was great. The crowd was enthusiastic, um, which was a wonderful thing. Um, you know, it's just a highlight of of my life. I think doing that that concert was great, and and the enthusiasm that I felt and the and being up there on stage and the band that was backing me and my backup dancers and backup singers and <laughs> everybody was great. So it was a lot of fun. And what was it like? Cause you, you, at the start, you mentioned something about, you know, being on stage, how you, you especially like watching live music and seeing the crowd reaction. So what was it like when you kind of got out there for the first time and had this massive crowd cheering your name and, and kind of getting that energy? What was, was it everything you kind of hoped it would be? Yeah, it definitely was. It's intimidating at first. When you first get on that stage and you and you have this big crowd in front of you, <clears throat> you know, you, you it's almost like, whoa, my God. <laughs> but um, then, you know, then you just feel the energy and you feel the love and and you just you just let it let it bring out the best in you, I think. And and that is and that was a wonderful experience. I mean, I, I never in my wildest dreams, I couldn't have imagined doing it. And so to have that experience was just a complete gift. And did you, when you were in New York preparing, did you do like open mic nights to kind of get used to that? Or was this just your first kind of like both feet in, jump in the deep end, sink or swim type of a concert? Yeah, it was jump in the deep end, sink or Oof. swim. Wow. I didn't, I didn't do, I didn't do any open mics. I, you know, I did um, perform in front of some of my, um, creative team mm -hmm. who were very candid in their feedback when I was doing well <laughs> and when I wasn't doing well, which is what I needed. That's, that's part of the fun. Um, but again, I work with an amazing performance coach. Her name is Robin Dunn. She actually is in the film and um, she just did, she, she brought me right up to speed. It took us a while to find it, but when we did, we were extraordinarily happy. So that's couldn't awesome. be better. That is awesome. Uh, so I, I know, I know you have a, interviews coming up so i'd like to switch i call it the lightning round is this short lightweight questions about the film sure. uh to see how your experiences map to the film i mean they are your experiences so they're going to be the same but yeah uh, you know you don't have to answer if you don't want to i try to keep them answerable though uh, sure. the first question is would you consider your voice sexy in a weird way yes excellent I would. <laughs> <laughs> that was a perfect way to start i love how she's like i don't want to be filmed and then you're like well that's a good lie we'll put it in. <laughs> yeah 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 i would i've been told that yes <laughs> uh what is the uh first time you performed live the first time i performed live was um when i when i was working and i uh did a skit for a talent show nice. back in um the uh early 2000s nice that's that sounds like so then that was your first bite of the performance bug yeah and that was my, the first time i was performing in front of an audience it was a dance routine yeah oh, wow. and um I, I was scared out of my mind but i had a lot of fun that's awesome uh what is your favorite music video 
Oh boy. I've got a lot of them. You, you um, can just name a couple if you can. All right. So uh, one of my all time favorites is let me love you by Neo. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I always turn to that one. Um, I've always, I've always loved um, thriller by Michael Jackson. That's one of my awesome. favorites. Um, what else is a big thing? Oh, Uptown Funk by um, Mark Ronson and, and um, Bruno Mars. That's a good one. Um, I think those are the, I, I'll go with those three for now. It's, those are all good answers. And, and there are no wrong answers because they're your answers. Yeah, exactly. Um, what is the favorite outfit of the ones that you wore for this film? Oh, my favorite outfit. Oh, my, yeah, my favorite outfit. <laughs> my favorite outfit was um, uh, dressing up in drag in the Philippines. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, that was, that was that was a lot of work, and that corset was brutal. But um, yeah, that was when I look at myself in that outfit, I'm like, boy, Doug, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> you look good. Yeah, exactly. But you know, and you suffered for your art, right? That's that's the yeah, exactly. Uh, what is your least favorite outfit? If that's your favorite outfit, I'm curious what your least favorite outfit is. Oh, my least favorite outfit. Um, probably because it was so uncomfortable. My least favorite outfit was the uh, bondage outfit that I used for the fear. <laughs> there you go. With all the ropes. It, trying to get into that was awful, and it was just very uncomfortable. <laughs> so, so liked corset, didn't like bondage. I, I feel like that's contradictory, but we'll, we'll allow it. Yeah, I, um, I understand. <laughs> uh, do you have a signature move? Uh, my signature dance moves are what I show in um, in finale. Okay. In the film, the the last number that we do, which is kind of freestyle. You know, it's whatever pops into my head. That's my signature dance move. Perfect. Your signature dance move is being being uh, dynamic. So I'll do yes, that. exactly. Um, what do you put in your yogurt? Uh, granola and um, mixed berries. I feel like you're contractually obligated to say honey at least in some amount, but uh, uh, you know, you know I, I I must admit that <laughs> I don't use honey. <laughs> oh, international! But I but I like honey flavored yogurt. <laughs> but I, I don't mix honey into my yogurt. International drama right here and there. I know. Uh, and I guess the last question is, you know, what's next for you? Uh, I assume maybe like some sort of X Games athlete, some sort of stunt driver. Like what, what is next uh, on, on the Doug McCorkle just craziness train? Yeah, Dave, that, David, that's a great question. Um, right now, uh, we're focused on the film. Uh, we've, we're out at all these film festivals and we're focused on getting a distributor for it. And then after that, we'll see what's next. It's, um, uh, you know, now that I've done this, the sky's the limit. We'll have to see what happens. But in terms of being like a stunt driver or, or uh, you know, a uh, boxer or something like that, I don't think that's in the cards. <laughs> you know what? I bet you didn't think uh, Rockstar was in the cards 10 years ago. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you just never know. Uh, so well, thanks so much for your time. This is Doug McCorkle, the star of I'm an Electric Lampshade, which is it's running the festival circuit. It's a interesting i love i love this statement a coming of age documentary about a 60 year old man who's pursuing his dreams it's 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 very interesting and fun and it'll, it'll put a smile on your face and maybe put a little bit of a fire in your heart thank you david very much great to Thanks. talk to you today thank you so much great talking to you too all right that was doug mccorkle the star of i'm an electric lampshade an artsy coming of age documentary about a 60 year old man who fulfills his dream of being a rock star i mean i think we, we can all relate to that it's currently running the festival circuit. I imagine it'll get some sort of theatrical release in the near future. So keep an eye out for it. It's very interesting. If you like this interview, please like and subscribe to this channel. It helps me out a lot. Make sure all my new content goes straight to you. Thank you.